Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. Uh, very happy to be joined by our third keynote speaker, Eva Wiebelt, who is at the Department of Economics right here at the University of Toronto. Um, she's mostly interested in like cash transfers and reducing barriers to evidence-based decision-making in global priorities research. I uh, took a PhD from Berkeley, went on to World Bank and various other institutions, including the Australian National University, very close to my heart. And so very happy to welcome um, Eva today and thank you very much. Great, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be presenting uh, this work on improving science by forecasting research results. And I'm going to start by giving sort of a broad motivation as to how forecasts can help and then move to actually specific tools that you can use. Okay. So just to start off, let's think of this thought experiment. Suppose you're in this really common situation where you see results vary across different studies and you're trying to understand why that is the case. You know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in treatment effects often. Um, you get a lot of different study results. This is a picture from some of my own work where essentially you've got a bunch of different interventions like conditional cash transfer programs or deworming programs. And you have a bunch of outcomes. So you know, attendance rate, enrollment rate. And essentially these are the results from a series of meta-analyses um, plotted out this way, uh, where you have you know, the interquartile range, maximum and minimum values, and some outliers there as the dots. And this is all in terms of standardized uh, mean differences. And so what you can see here is there's a fair amount of heterogeneity and you can't necessarily extrapolate very well from one particular study result to another context. I mean, a lot of things have changed, right? <laughs> so um, this was a little bit uh, disappointing to me to see, you know, I started this very naively thinking, okay, as we're going to, you know, we do these impact evaluations partially to inform policy decisions. And it would be nice if, you know, we had some kind of um, fairly uh, narrow set of results here, but it's not that surprising when you think about it because so many things change when you move from one context to another. The way I think about these differences is through the framework of heterogeneous treatment effects. So suppose you have got some treatment um, T and you care about some outcome Y and you're estimating this first equation. Well, great, but suppose like the true state of the world, you're actually got this other thing going on where there's some interaction terms. So suppose your program depends on, you know, how well the government actually implemented it. And so this beta three term that is capturing the effect of that interaction is actually really important. And by estimating that top equation, um, you're failing to capture that. And when you go to another place, you're then you're essentially getting like a biased estimate. It's not going to uh, translate to so well to another setting. And you can think of many other examples like th of this kind. So, you know, you're doing a study in one uh, particular lab, you're trying to replicate it in another lab you're getting different results and you're really not sure why and the issue is that there can be all sorts of different um, interactions here right you can have an even much more complicated model I'm giving you kind of like the simplest kind of uh, framework here right and so yeah I've got this nice little graphic of turtles all the way down because the way I think of the world is as having interaction effects all the way down and when some interaction term changes your results are going to change this isn't a problem if you can kind of explain that variation, but there's just not enough data out there to try to tease apart everything that's going on, okay? So what can you do? And I would argue that one of the things you can do is to use forecasts. Uh, you can use forecasts for other purposes too, but this is potentially one of them. Um, so people actually do know a lot and um, there's a lot of information that they have that they're sort of aggregating when they're giving you their estimate of what will happen. 
So this is why I've got this sort of picture of a glacier here trying to represent the deep submerged knowledge that people are drawing upon um, when they're sort of giving you some kind of summary statistic, okay? Um, they're essentially summarizing a large amount of knowledge. Now, you know, the tricky thing is, of course, people can be wrong. <laughs> um, and I mean, that's the whole reason why we do all sorts of studies and randomized controlled trials, et cetera, to try to get away from people just sort of saying their own opinion. Um, nonetheless, in principle, at least, you can imagine that there may be some informational content in people's forecasts, and that if you gather enough of them, and especially if you connect them to real research results, you know, you connect them to RCT results, you can start to learn when they're more or less accurate as gauged by these external, you know, results. So taking a step back further, um, you know, why else uh, should we care about collecting forecasts of research results? Uh, well, here's just a screenshot of a uh, paper in Science that uh, Stefano Delvina, Devin Pope, and I uh, wrote, um, I think, in 2019, um, where we go through a few different motivations. And just to further motivate this, here are some of uh, those uh, answers, as well as a few other reasons. So first, gathering forecasts of research results can help you evaluate the novelty and credibility of those research results. So how surprising are they? Or sort of in our context, are they likely to replicate? Um, I'd also argue that by gathering these forecasts, you can start to mitigate publication bias against null results, because you know, as we all know, it's really hard to publish null results. And yet, if you can show that some result is surprising, well, maybe, you know, even if it's zero or close to zero, um, that's still informative. That's, you know adding to our body of knowledge here. So gathering forecasts ex ante can sort of help you sort of show that this was in fact a contribution. Um, you can also imagine, well, forecasts can help you answer substantive research questions, uh, for example, about uh, forecasting itself or how people update their beliefs. They can also provide important summary statistics. Like sometimes we actually really want to know what people think and that's its own sort of thing. Maybe more relevant for us here, uh, I would argue that forecasts can help you improve your experimental design. So you may want to focus on, you know, which topics have the highest value of information and you can learn that by collecting these forecasts. Uh, they can provide some priors for Bayesian analyses and Hopefully, in the long run, uh, we might even be able to use them as somewhat informative data in their own right. So let me say a little bit more about each of these. So first, in terms of evaluating the novelty and credibility of research results, you know, this is mostly helping to counter that common critique in seminars uh, that you know we knew that already or maybe you get a referee report back and it says well what is this adding you know this is not that interesting if you collect forecasts you can a little bit say look this is exactly what we contributed <laughs> you know you really didn't know about this beforehand uh, of course for that to be the case you need to gather these forecasts ex ante to avoid hindsight bias right um, and as I mentioned, um, you know, this may help to mitigate publication bias um, against null results. Now, I don't want to lean too, too hard on this point because you might expect if everybody starts collecting forecasts of their own research uh, results, we might have a different bias creep in, which is people sort of trying to show somehow that the results are surprising, you know. <laughs> um, I'm basically okay with that right now. I think it's better than the current norm of uh, publication bias against uh, null results um, because it's at least somewhat informative. Um, and also because drawing attention to surprising results, um, it also sort of opens them up to more scrutiny. And there's this interesting and subtle trade-off, in fact, between novelty and credibility. Um, because if you have a result that's really super surprising, it might also mean that it's less likely to replicate and that there's something just fundamentally you know, wrong with the study. So for example, you know, somebody um, 
uh, if, you, if you're truly Bayesian and you see a study that says, you know, ESP is real, <laughs> extra, extrasensory perception exists, okay, uh, you would probably be pretty skeptical of that. And I think you would be right to be skeptical of that. And you would want to look at the methods more carefully. So it's not the case that, you know, just showing a result is surprising, okay, you're done. Um, there's actually this, you know, kind of nuanced trade off. Um, the other thing that I think is important here is that if you collect forecast six and T, they can also help you be a little bit more honest in your framing of the paper in the same kind of way that uh, often you see somebody present a model that they created based on some data and the model happens to fit the data really well. And they're like, okay, well, you know, I tested this model. It's like, well, you know, maybe you overfit it. You know, this is based on the data you got. And here, I think, the way that um, researchers themselves design experiments may be in part a function of the priors that the researchers themselves had. So you can have forecasts from other researchers or um, other people out there, but you can also imagine, I mean, the forecasts of the research team themselves are actually kind of important. And uh, if you collect forecasts ex ante, it allows you to say a little bit both about your own perceptions as well as what the field thought. So that when you're writing in your paper, you know, this result is surprising and these are our contributions, you have a little bit more to ground that on. Okay, I mentioned forecasts can also help you answer some substantive research questions. Um, sometimes we really do just want to know what people think and it's actually valuable. So here's one example from Advani Ash, Kaya and Razul, where they noticed that there are not that many articles in economics journals at least on race related research topics, okay, uh, especially compared to other fields. And so they're interested in, well, why is this the case? And one part of that is understanding whether people are even aware of this uh, statistic. So they gathered forecasts to get people's uh, ex ante beliefs about that, that were themselves sort of a valuable contribution. Um, also, you can imagine uh, that these. Um, Forecasts can, of course, contribute to research on belief updating. So in some of my work with Aidan Koval of the World Bank, we're looking at how policymakers update their beliefs in response to research results. Um, so here, you know, it's feeding in very directly. They can also be helpful in experimental design. So just as an example, suppose you are the UK nudge unit and you want to make a study of police retention and you've got 10 ideas about potential interventions you can run, but you can only run three of them. So which do you choose? Well, again, you may want to select those which have the highest value of information. And again, this also, um, which has the highest value of information depends a little bit in part. I mean, you can imagine not just surveying researchers, but surveying sort of the end users of this information, right? Like, can you actually survey the policymakers that will be responding to whatever your research findings would be? Maybe you're in that kind of situation, depending. Um, and uh, if you knew something about their decision rule, et cetera, you could back out which one you should be focused on. Um, otherwise, if you're just getting the forecasts of researchers, you're also still able to say, well, which contributes the most to you know our knowledge of the world, <laughs> okay? Um, and you can think of this as well in the context of replications, obviously. Um, and I believe yesterday Fiona Fiddler was talking about um, replication um, project. I will mention that. Um, I go into a little bit more detail about that. Uh, just a couple slides. Um, so oftentimes, you know, I make this argument: look, you can choose which treatment to pursue, and people say, look. I only have got the one treatment. How is this useful for me for my experimental design? Um, well, you still have some choice. You often at least have choice about which outcomes you are measuring, uh, how many survey rounds you need to actually have enough power for certain outcomes. And um, you might have some outcomes that happen to have um, a lot more variance in them. And right now, if you're doing power calculations very frequently, we're going to be uh, um, you know, pulling some numbers for the power calculations from thin air, right? I mean, it would be great if they're grounded in something, but oftentimes there isn't that data that you would like, and forecasts can at least help a little bit like that. Um, 
Now, they can also provide some priors for Bayesian analysis. So of course, if you are doing any kind of Bayesian analysis, you need some kind of choice of priors. And the question is, which priors? Uh, so expert forecasts can be one input to that. Uh, just as an example here, Mackenzie, Miguel, Iacovone, and Perez have got this registered report. Um, so, you know, results blind review, accepted paper um, at the Journal of Development Economics. So, of course, it doesn't necessarily need to end up there. Um, where they're looking at, um, they actually elicit these expert forecasts and then compare Bayesian and frequentist methods uh, using those uh, priors. So that's, uh, I think they'll have a working paper this summer, hopefully. So it's still sort of in the pipeline, but just as one example you can turn to. And eventually, you know, this is farther out in the future, my own personal hope is that we can improve forecasts enough that we can use them as data. Um, and not, uh, again, not in a sort of naive way, but, you know, we can learn a little bit about when they're more likely to be correct, how we can debias them and aggregate them to make better forecasts. And if they're accurate enough, um, and of course accurate enough depends on the application. So um, for example, if you are completely risk neutral and there's no reason to believe that, um, you know, uh, like making mistakes doesn't penalize you more than, you know, the benefits that you would gain potentially, that any information is helpful, okay? Then the data being at least partially informative, great, let's use that. If we don't have other data, let's use all the information we can get. Um, of course, you know, if you're a little bit um, more risk averse or whatnot, then, you know, there, there's trade-offs to be made there. Um, but, you know, at least in principle, it's possible that these forecasts could be an informative part um, when we don't have better evidence. And especially if in the early days, you know, we connect them with results from, you know, rigorous academic studies. So there's uh, also going back to the earliest point here where I was trying to motivate this with, we see that results vary a lot. There has been some effort to try to predict when um, results will generalize a bit better. So for example, there's this paper by De Lavinia and Pope where they look at, they ask you know, experts to sort of forecast uh, different factors associated with external validity. Um, in this particular instance, it doesn't seem like the forecasters are um, uh, as good at predicting the factors uh, as they think they would be. So for example, they ask them, um, you know, they've got a whole bunch of different treatment arms and essentially rank the treatments um, just overall first. Um, and they do a replication of that and they ask people to predict the replication results. Um, but they also ask people to predict um, whether the rank order of those treatment effects changes by different demographics, different tweaks to the experiment. Um, so that's you know some early work along that vein. Of course, there's like a bigger literature on forecasts. So there's, of course, the Good Judgment Project and some science prediction markets. You may have seen some of these papers out there. There's also the DARPA score uh, project where a bunch of teams like Replicats and Replication Markets um, were working on that. And I believe yesterday at this workshop, Fiona Fiddler was speaking. I apologize, I was teaching at that time, so I didn't see it. But um, bad timing. Uh, but I know her work very well because, of course, she's in Melbourne and uh, we, we've, we've chatted quite a bit on this of, you know, using forecasts um, to predict which results will replicate. Um, so this is a huge, well-funded initiative and I'm really excited to see what will come out of that in the future. Um, there's, of course, um, also many individual projects that have tried to collect forecasts for their own research projects. And I would say that this is really especially taken off in economics. Um, I'm not so sure about other fields. I just don't uh, know so well about them. But in economics, I think it's really growing. And there's a pretty obvious reason for this, which in my opinion, which is it's the sense incentives are aligned, <laughs> right? Um, right now it's kind of functioning a little bit, almost like insurance against null results. I'm sorry to say, like, you know, you want to collect forecasts for your own study, um, because if you have null results, then you might be able to, 
say, well, look, at least they're surprising no results. Now, I don't think that's like the right approach in some sense, like um, you should be collecting forecasts because you want to compare them against what's uh, surprising, regardless what you find, you know, you want to just look at what is surprising overall. Um, nonetheless, it's no doubt a part of the reason why a lot of projects have been uh, using them lately, and I think they do independent of that, add a lot to papers because you can then have like a little table or a little figure that shows exactly, you know, what your results were versus what people forecast they would be. So what is the contribution of your own stuff? Okay, so um, Stefano Della Vigna had a bunch of work on this vein with uh, some co-authors and I had a bunch of work on this vein with some co-authors and we kind of came together to make this social science prediction platform. Uh, and this particular tool, this is a platform that you can use to forecast research results um, in the social sciences. It's not just economics, any social science. And here um, you can forecast a whole bunch of things. You can forecast summary stats, like the mean treatment effect. Um, you can uh, forecast a distribution of um, priors. Um, so you put weight in bins that the treatment effect will fall here or here or here. You think it's like a 10% chance it's here, or 20% chance it's there. And uh, there's actually other stats. You can also forecast, I'll sort of highlight a little bit later. Who are the forecasters? Well, they again can be anyone and who they're going to be is going to depend on your research topic and what's relevant. So for most research projects, I think one highly relevant group is other researchers, but you can also collect forecasts from policymakers in some contexts or members of the general public. For example, there's this one project that I'm currently working on, which is the Y Combinator Basic Income Project. And it's a really large cash transfer project where we're giving out, uh, well, not we, but we're evaluating this program that is giving out $1,000 a month unconditionally for three years to the people in the treatment group. So this is like a huge, highly politicized topic, right? What is the impact of giving people cash? That's Everybody's got an opinion on that. So for us, it's actually informative and useful to know, well, what does the general populace think? You know, what do Democrats think and Republicans think? What do people who work in different areas think or um, urban rural uh, split? It's, you know, also important. So we're gathering forecasts from each of these groups. You know, depending on your research project, maybe you only want forecasts from researchers so you can compare it against, um, you know, received wisdom. But it is possible that for some projects, you may want different groups. So I mentioned this is a joint venture. And uh, here's, uh, you know, the, the team. Um, there's a lot of support um, from uh, BITS at UC Berkeley. Um, OK. And uh, in terms of the types of priors that you can predict. So you can make predictions for any kind of you know, field experiment, lab experiment, other kinds of impact evaluations. Um, I just listed here some examples just pulled from the platform. This is not comprehensive in any way. I just literally was like, okay, what are some of the ones that I can <laughs> pull from there? Um, and then some are statistics, including um, model accuracy. So you can predict, you know, how well models um, will actually match reality. So that, that would count, okay? Um, just to go in depth on one particular example here. Um, so this is some work that Aidan Koval and I did where we ran discrete choice experiments at a series of World Bank and Inter-American Development Bank workshops. And what we did was that we essentially asked people um, to choose between one of two programs. Uh, so program A or program B. Um, and these different programs had different attributes. So for example, in this particular um, selection, uh, you got program A is observational. And program B is, an, is experimental, it was evaluated by a randomized control trial. Program A was done in the same, you've got an impact evaluation done in the same country as the one that you're trying to extrapolate to. Program B was done in a different country, but at least it was in the same region. And then you also have impact on enrollment rates. So program A had a large effect, but um, very uncertain. You got very wide confidence intervals on that. And program B, you had a smaller effect, but it was you know, more precisely estimated. And 
there's also this additional piece of information that a local expert tells you that they think program A would perform better, okay, in your particular context. So we asked a bunch of these kinds of questions and people answered um, a whole slew of them. And based on those data, then you can, you know, uh, model exactly how much weight they're putting on each of these kinds of factors, okay? And so when it turns, when it turns to trying to predict this, it's actually a little bit uh, of a complicated thing to predict, right? Because you say, look, um, how do I get somebody to predict the results of a discrete choice, like the, the simplest kind of way you can analyze discrete choice would be say with a conditional logit model. So what are you gonna ask people to predict? Like odds ratios, or marginal effects? Like how are you going, it's going to be strange because not even, it's not linear, right? Um, so we are, we try to make it as simple as possible for people. And in general, I would advise and recommend trying to make the, the surveys as simple as possible. Um, here we try to simplify this down into just asking people to predict what share of time people would uh, select program B versus program A given certain things. Okay, so we had um, these different people who had been doing the exercise, like practitioners or policymakers, um, even other researchers um, in some context, and we asked them, okay, say uh, if a practitioner observed Program B had an estimated impact of 10 percentage points, and Program A had an estimated impact of zero percentage points, and you know nothing else about which other characteristics were associated with each of these two programs, what percent of the time do you think a practitioner would choose Program B? So that's sort of collapsing it down to one you know, number. And we emphasized, you know, these attributes are randomized. <laughs> so, um, you know, even if a practitioner prefers th those options with larger estimated impacts, as one might expect, it's not going to be the case that they're going to select them 100% of the time. This is what this is basically getting at. And even because, you know, there, there might be some other attributes that they also care about that just randomly by chance happen to be better for program A than program B. So it's not going to be 100% of the time, even if they care about it. And even if they don't care about impact at all, well, in that case, they're just going to select it about 50% of the time, again, because of this randomization. So we're trying to explain sort of what's going on here and, and giving people, you know, just making sure that the exercise is clear and people sort of have a good sense in their mind of what we're asking for. And then we can ask, you know, given this information, if a practitioner observed that program B had an estimated impact of 10 percentage points, program A had an estimated impact at zero percentage points, what percent of the time do you think a practitioner would choose program B? And we have a little pop-up that people can, you know, click here from the details. You know, one thing I didn't put in these slides, just in the interest of time, is of course we went over like the sample and recruitment and all those kinds of details, which might be relevant if you're trying to uh, make these forecasts, right? Um, and we went through this kind of exercise for a whole bunch of different attributes, so methods used, et cetera. Um, and what can you get out of this? Again, just sort of extending this example to show you, you know, some results and how we can use it in a paper. So here we're just plotting the predicted versus observed. Um, so here, and, and the, the dashed line is a 45 degree line where people make, you know, exactly accurate forecasts. Um, there's clearly a bias in the way people are making their forecasts here. Um, they're predicting that people are sort of uh, moving based on those attributes more than they actually do overall, um, except for impact <laughs> for researchers. Um, so researchers are the dark blue squares, policymakers are the orange triangles. And one way of reading this is you literally just go down from the top and you see, okay, the thing that researchers thought, and these are all forecasts by researchers, I should say, the thing that researchers thought uh, other researchers would care the most about is that the study not be observational. Um, and they thought the second most important thing will be that it's an RCT, that it has small confidence intervals, it's really precise. But if you look at in reality, what kinds of uh, attributes they chose, I mean, so those are all things having to do with, you know, the rigor of the study, basically. Um, in reality, if we go rather than top down, we look right to left here on the slide, the first thing they cared about was impact. The second thing they cared about was fine, it not being observational. But the third thing they cared about was whether it was recommended by a local expert. 
So it's a little bit interesting because it changes the narrative of it. And so this is a part of what, you know, you can get from collecting forecasts. You say, you know, these are the things that people thought and you can sh show very clearly what the difference is from that. Um, and uh, policymakers, well, they also care the most about impact. Researchers did predict that one correctly. So it's mostly, you know, lack of sort of self-awareness amongst researchers, perhaps. Okay. So, but that was just like one example. Of course, you can collect priors for all sorts of different kinds of things. And we're le really leaving this open to the researchers who are using the platform in terms of what kinds of things they want to forecast. Um, the platform is uh, based around Qualtrics surveys. Um, so, you know, Qualtrics has a very well developed um, uh, form of um, survey development that lots of people in economics use. I think it's probably the main one. And um, we can't really reinvent the wheel better than them on that. So we're just sort of um, allowing people to submit their own sort of surveys and we basically run with it. We, we don't put uh, constraints. Um, if we saw something really wacky, maybe we would, but we haven't seen anything like that yet. And so then the typical way of using this platform, you know, a researcher will design a study and collect uh, baseline data. Um, Baseline data is really, really great to collect and include um, some summer stats in your uh, survey because that'll really help people know a lot more about the context and what they you know, might kind of expect it. And it'll help them get a more concrete sense of the situation. So you collect some baseline data and then you design the forecasting survey and send it to the platform. Um, the platform distributes the forecasting survey and probably the researchers also you know, um, promulgate it a bit. And then only at that point, afterwards, they gather the results data for the study. The forecasting survey results um, then are released to the researcher. The researcher can say ex ante what date they want to get those forecasts. And then the study results, um, once the researchers have them, they input them back to the platform and those are automatically shared then back with the forecasters. So this is like a typical flow. This is not the only flow. Uh, in particular, if you want to use forecast to change your study design, um, well, then you know you're going to want to receive those forecasts back a little bit early <laughs> and change your design. So you know, rearrange these components depending on what you're trying to do here. But this, I think, is like the most typical flow. And notice, you know, you're getting um, the forecast before you have got the data, right? Um, so. A platform does offer um, several advantages itself. Um, you know, you could just collect forecasts on your own without a platform, but having a platform is really helpful. Uh, first, it helps to coordinate learning about forecasts. So, you know, we have a lot of um, elements that we're sort of supplying as like a public good, like we've got templates and stuff. Um, it helps attract forecasters over time. So then you can maybe learn a little bit more about when the forecasts are accurate. Uh, provides third party party certification of when the forecasts were gathered and when they were made available. And it also just makes it easier for both the researchers to collect and use the forecasts as well as the forecasters to provide and learn from the forecasts. So what do I mean by coordinating learning about the forecasts? Well, there's actually you know, one of the motivations for setting up this platform is that we saw a lot of individual research teams starting to collect forecasts for their own projects. And that's great, um, but it's a little bit dangerous too, right? Because suppose you have, you know, a hundred different research teams all being like, okay, I want to spam, you know, a thousand people asking them to predict my study results. Um, that's not so great. People might start, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of emails myself with requests and that's fine, I do them. But, you know, if there were a lot of them, maybe I would stop to doing them, you know, like maybe at a certain point, I mean, it is, um, a public good that people are providing giving forecasts. It's, you know, like a mini version of writing a referee report almost, right? So we wanted to sort of spread out the load. Um, and one way of doing that is to, you know, allow people to say on the platform, look, I only want to get requests uh, to do forecasts like once a month or something, and I'll do them once a month, but like, please only notify me, you know, about, you know, a certain number. And, uh, we thought, you know, some coordination would be helpful. I mean, it would be nice if journals did this, right, <laughs> across different journals for sending you referee report requests. Um, the other thing here is, you know, it does enable 
the systematic collection of forecasts and results and, and uh, in a very transparent way. So we have got a lot of things that we sort of developed over time, like a forecasting survey guide and a template for people that maybe make it a little bit easier for people um, to uh, you know, go ahead and use this using some of our past knowledge on this. Of course, we can track the forecasters over time, which is great. Um, should allow us to say a little bit more about whether certain characteristics of the forecasters are really associated with, you know, making more accurate forecasts or identify these super forecasters. And, you know, importantly, it provides third party certification. So the main thing that you're concerned about when you're forecasting research results is, well, did the forecasters hear of the results? And you don't even necessarily need them to have um, you know, you don't need to have like a published paper necessarily for somebody to have heard of results. Like you can have a working paper out there. You can have, you know, some analyses that they somehow heard about. So if you have a timestamp on when the forecasts were collected and you know when the data were gathered, that would help, <laughs> right? Um, you can say, yes, these are truly ex ante. And uh, so we currently ask the researchers to report whether the data had been, you know, not collected, partially collected, fully collected. And, um, also when the researchers themselves knew of the forecasts. So in particular, here's the concern, you know, you're gathering forecasts and you say, oh, okay, well, this thing looks like it could be surprising. Let's try to like tweak something about how we're implementing this project or how we're analyzing the data to make it like more surprising. So, you know, I think this is a relatively minor concern right now, just because forecasting is still so new and people are sort of putting it on at the end. And it's not a, like a major part of the puzzle. like probably before this point, you've already done your pre-analysis plan and whatnot. So I think this is like a small piece of it. But nonetheless, um, we allow researchers to specify when they want to receive the forecasts too. And I said it makes it easier. And we have the survey guide uh, for researchers. Um, so this is actually quite an extensive guide. It just keeps on going down and down and down on this page. Like there's no way that I can screenshot the whole thing. Um, so yeah, you know, we have like common mistakes. We have sample surveys, um, we've got annotated surveys, we've got um, some, we've got a template, we've got tips, we've got a lot of different things here. Um, so here's just like one example of like an annotated survey where you sort of point out like, look, here are some helpful features to include in your survey, like um, link to the pre-analysis plan. That's really helpful. Um, you know, have some kind of graphic, describe these certain things. Um, so I've got some of those. And I would say that actually explaining what the project was in enough detail that allows people to forecast it well is probably the hardest part of building a forecasting survey because you want to provide enough detail but you don't want people to be like wow this survey is overwhelming it's like you know uh 30 minutes long nobody's gonna do it um so you you want to keep it like pretty uh short and compact and yet still explain enough that it's worthwhile and then we also do have a uh, you know, subject pool and some different kinds of distribution options I'll talk about in a minute. And we try to make it easy to share the results back with the forecasters because you know, often you're collecting results and uh, somewhere you, in your documents, you wanna say, look, I want, I'm sharing these back with the people who gave the forecasts, right? Um, but that also can take a lot of time and effort and work. And so one nice thing is if you just input your results to the platform, then that's sort of shared back with the forecasters automatically. <clears throat> and one thing that I really like about this is it does enable researchers to sort of easily archive their past surveys and show them for anybody who's interested. So, you know, here's just one example from my own work uh, with Aiden Koval, where we had like, you know, you can see like the, those red arrows I just sort of put in myself, uh, draw, draw, drew in here. Uh, for a study ID, we've got like a unique ID for it, and you can download the Qualtrics file, you know, if you want, you can download our own thing and play around with it. Um, and uh, on the forecasting side, again, we're trying to make it easy for the forecasters themselves. So we've got a prediction dashboard where people can view the different studies. Um, like I guess the one at the bottom here actually is on uh, replication. Um, and uh, they, there are now a whole bunch of different fields. Uh, this is just a sample of them um, that I happen to see on my own dashboard. Um, so we've got, you know, mostly economics here, but some cognitive psychology or social psychology, um, different fields within economics. And as I say, like when results are available, we share them back. 
So here, this is um, from that uh, study I mentioned earlier um, by Advani et al, where they're looking at uh, what share of articles in top five economics journals are race related. And you see here the true result, you see the mean prediction and your own response. And the uh, histogram behind it is the histogram of the forecast that other people made. So we don't actually share that ex ante with people as they're making the forecasts, um, because the thought is it's maybe more informative to actually get people's um, individual estimates without them seeing, oh, look, somebody else had like this whole distribution of forecasts, so maybe now I'm nudged to say something that's sort of closer to the mean. Um, you can, you can uh, do that, that's totally valid. Um, you know, our choice was just to have, um, you know, people are doing this independently um, and they don't get to observe beforehand before they make their forecasts what other people are uh, saying here. And at least so far, people seem to actually be pretty excited about it. So, you know, we were able to, uh, so there's actually like more than a quarter of people want to be emailed just any time a survey is published, which is pretty great. Um, and uh, a lot of people get it, get these weekly or monthly digests. Right now, we're actually only doing monthly digests because we don't want to overwhelm people. But uh, yeah, pretty good demand so far. So who are these forecasters? Um, well, mostly they're in economics, but uh, there's actually a surprising amount of participation from other fields, given that we have not done any outreach what to speak of to other fields. It's not that we're against other fields. We just don't, you know, have as uh, great connections to them. So, you know, if you're watching this from a different field, please feel free to go and you know run with it because uh, I think it's probably a mat only a matter of time until people in other disciplines also are like, ah, yeah, I could use forecasts. And probably the greatest returns in terms of publication value to using forecasts, or you know, if you're sort of on the early end of that, is just my guess. Um, so you know. Um, about 40% from other disciplines and then within economics, there's a lot in development, a lot in behavioral or experimental, or more generally like applied micro or labor topics as well. Okay, of course we don't have these data for people who took the surveys anonymously because we do have like the option that you can get like anonymous surveys, right? So this is only for people who sort of sign up and have an account. In terms of what is being forecast, well, there's different kinds of statistics. So um, a lot of people are actually just uh, forecasting summary statistics. Uh, there's also treatment effects or like first stage. So like say you've got some treatment and uh, first you care about, well, what was the take up rate? Um, so one way that a study might not, you know, replicate in a different context is that, you know, your first stage is different. So you can try to like tease apart a little bit. Well, why are these results different? Well, maybe they had a different first stage. Okay. So, um, and, um, you know, just some uh, units, a lot of them are in percent or percentage points, but, you know, standard deviations, like there's a whole bunch of different things people use. And just as another example of sort of the range of things that you could uh, forecast, um, this is based on some early work that I'm doing with um, Miriam Golden, Alex Gacko, and actually a bunch of political scientists. Uh, I'm the lone economist on the team, um, where we are trying to uh, forecast, uh, we're asking people to forecast COVID deaths. And what we did is we first did a separate exercise where we asked, where we essentially had like a model challenge where we ask people to uh, submit models of that that had some kind of social science variable in them or political science variable um, that uh, would predict COVID deaths and then um, in this stage what we're doing is seeing what kinds of weights people put on these different models actually being accurate at future points in time so um, by the end of you know August 2021 and or August 2022 I mean even though COVID has been around for quite a while it will still be around for <laughs> a while and uh, this is both you know uh, cross-nationally as well as sub-nationally so uh, for certain countries um, and especially in uh, lower income countries it's going to be a while, I think. So, um, yeah. Anyway, so what we're doing here with the stacking model, this is actually a type of meta model. Um, think of uh, the intuition is um, think of like a linear regression. If you've got two different variables that you're putting into that regression and uh, they happen to be correlated, well, you know, the 
coefficient that you're estimating on both of them and how much they're contributing to the model, each independently is reduced because they're correlated. And so what the stacking model does is essentially that, um, but um, here you're, you're assigning like the weights to the different models and how much those different models contribute in the meta model, okay? Um, so um, this isn't exactly the way it's gonna be, is we're probably gonna simplify it a little bit more from here, but just to give some idea that you can also use this to sort of forecast the accuracy of different models. So there's all sorts of things that you can you know, do with that. In terms of distribution options, uh, so we have our own sort of subject pool that we email links to the surveys to. Um, you can also put your survey up on the website and just sort of passively get forecasts from whoever happens to go to the website. Um, you can create personalized email links. So this is really useful if you've got a certain target population you want to get. So, you know, you say, okay, these are 40 experts in the field. These are, you know, this is a subset of uh, policy types who are you're know, actually really involved with the project and know what's going on. Or you have different maybe groups of people that you really want to get uh, forecasts from. And so you can create these personalized links. And one thing that I would even emphasize here is you don't even need that many people to make these forecasts for those forecasts to be valuable. In fact, um, we'd done some work that suggested really, you know, only need to, you know, a small number like 30 or something. Um, so, I mean, it's great, to, you know, you could have more, but there are trade offs, right? So, um, we're, you know, even with a small number, you can generally distinguish, um, you, you have pretty small confidence intervals around the uh, estimated uh, uh, treatment effect, pretty much. Um, they've got, you know, they, they do pretty well in that. Um, you can also share the survey via an anonymous link. So for example, if you want to share it over Twitter and just sort of get whoever sees it on Twitter, you can do that. Of course, you know, there's demographic questions that then you can, you know, add so that if you're getting these responses through the anonymous link, you know something about who is taking the survey. Um, and importantly, you can create multiple versions of the same survey so that you can track the different subject pools uh, because, you know, of course, if you've got like a bunch of different groups that you want to target, you want to know which are the ones that are coming from this particular set of researchers versus this set of researchers versus this um, set of policymakers or whatever. And um, within those groups, I mean, there's like a quasi an anonymity um, where um, you know, you're defining the, the groups that you're sending it to. You can see like how many people um, out of that group um, actually took it and so you can calculate your response rates but you can't sort of match the responses back to the individual people. Um, it's often you know a complicating factor for IRB if you know the results are not anonymous so it's essentially it's anonymous to you it's not necessarily anonymous on the back side of the platform if you match up the state of table with the state of the table but there's nothing that like you know matches them um, it, um, in an obvious way to uh, the researcher downloading the data so um, I would still recommend you have to uh, check with your own institution's IRB as to, you know, whether this is a thing that you need to, um, you know, get ethics approval for just collecting forecasts. Um, often it is. Um, so just FYI. Um, and to actually use the platform, you have to click a box that says that if your institution requires it, um, you know, you've uh, uh, gone with IRB, of course. Um, so just to highlight a few other transparency related elements of the website. So suppose you want to create um, a survey. Great. You start by starting a new project and this is where you can organize multiple surveys once you've created one because as I say you can have different versions of the survey that you send to different groups. And here just a couple of things to highlight. I mentioned earlier we're collecting the date that the forecasts are released. So you know, if you sort of leave that blank, you can basically see them immediately, but you can, if you want, bind your hands and say, I want to only receive them later on. Um, you can also say, um, and you, you have to say <laughs> when the data was collected, okay? Um, and we ask as well if it's uh, pre-registered, uh, you know, apart from other things in here that you might care about, like <laughs> who are the authors, what is the title of it, etc. cetera. Um, ask you to specify a discipline and field and those kinds of details. And we also have some uh, sort of automated data sharing uh, 
uh, capabilities here. So first, you know, as I was saying earlier, you can share your Qualtrics file with the public. Um, it's actually opt in to keep that private. Um, I think most people, it's actually a good idea to make that public, uh, so people can check up on it very easily. It's you know helpful if you're submitting a paper and you've got like this big um, appendix. Otherwise, to say like here was a survey. <laughs> um, in some cases, you might be able to say, well, just here's the survey, like on a link, go here and check it out if you want. Um, here's our ID. Um, so there's that. Um, we provide feedback to the forecasters, um, but you can select, I mean, there may be special cases where you want to keep that momentarily, at least in the short run private, like um, if uh, you're doing another round of the survey later on with people, maybe you don't want them to, um, you know, immediately um, see something. And of course, we have fields for if you're registered at the AEA or OSF, you can sort of put that information so it's linked in as well. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, in the future, these different, having collected these different factors will be fruitful in the future. So, okay, so, you know, I hope that you sort of find this tool sort of generally helpful and go and use it for your own different projects. The URL is here. If you're interested, it has its own Twitter account. Uh, here's my own contact information if you ever want to get in touch with me and I've got my own Twitter account. Um, and so, yeah, feel free to uh, chat and drop a line and I hope that it's a helpful tool. Um, I think we have like three minutes left for questions. So I'll leave it there. No, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I signed up. Uh, so so, I, so I, I've just signed up and, and everyone else should, of course, as well. Um, <laughs> Great. Uh, I'll just, I don't know that there are too many questions in the chat. If anyone has any questions, just um, feel free to add them in. Uh, I might just sort of go through some of the grad students and see if anyone has any things. Otherwise, these things tend to be dominated by the Faculty. Um, Amy, I mean, just to start, did, Amy, did you have anything you want to add? Uh, nothing in particular, no, thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll just go through the stats, some of the stats, grad students that I noticed in the chat, in, in around here. Um, Maria, Sabrina. Yeah, no particular questions for me either, but this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, this was actually, um, I, I didn't realize this was part of economics. Yeah, I know. Ever really should be in data science or um, statistics. We'll uh, we'll try and steal her, Maria. Uh, Sabrina, did you? No. Um, turning to some of the um, folks that I, I'm just trying to look through the participants, um, see who might be interested. Um, Garrett, did you? Um, Garrett was one of our speakers from yesterday. Did you want to add anything? I haven't been paying attention to the Slack, so I don't know if there's... No, I've, I've been having a look. So. No, um, or Ryan? Ryan, are you around? Briggs? No, may have left. Jake, did you want to add anything? I'm... Um... To uh, have guidance about how to combine, say, um, randomization-based statistical inference with Bayesian inference, if you have all these wonderful forecasts as your priors. Yeah, so I missed the per first part of that uh, the question just because the, the audio was cutting out. But it, essentially, is it like how do you combine the priors with? Yeah, the like we ex we tend to have experiments and we tend to base p values in a very, or I tend to think of them in a very Fisherian or Neimanian way. At the same time, you're getting these great forecasts which give me priors. Uh, how do I combine those two kind of ideas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's a few things you can do. Um, I mean, people do calculate like um, credible interviews and uh, intervals and kind of like the um, equivalent of um, um, the t-test accepted in a sort of Bayesian way. Um, a lot of my own work on generalizability, um, actually uh, what you can do is um, sort of try to sort of model using some of these, you know, hierarchical Bayesian models or whatever you want, try to model the, um, um, extent to which um, 
different uh, factors are driving the variance in your results. And so these are, you know, tools more often used in other disciplines, but the RCT results are actually super useful for that because then you can say, look, you know, suppose I do have enough data to do some kind of like meta regression, I can put in those, you know, different um, RCT coefficients, et cetera. Even for one particular study, um, I think it's completely reasonable to say, look, you know, you've got this set of expert priors. Um, we're going to take them seriously. They may not be like 100% correct, but, um, you know, we're going to take them seriously and show how, you know, the results would change, uh, you know, uh, if you do the Bayesian analysis with those expert priors versus some other kind of priors. And I think it's important to sort of test the sensitivity of your results to which kind of priors you're using. But I mean, you can incorporate the research results as essentially, you know, the, the new information that you're, you're updating on in this way. Um, and there's a bunch of different statistics you can uh, look at there. So there's actually a couple of papers I'd like to have. So um, again, like the, um, so Ma Rachel Meeker has done a lot of work on this and um, uh, that there's that paper uh, that I referenced earlier that um, with uh, David McKenzie et al, where that will hopefully come out this summer where they're doing exactly this within economics. Um, there's also um, a nice thing recently put out by Dan Stein of ID Insight, where it's essentially a guide mostly for, like for uh, practitioners, but also researchers <laughs> about doing Bayesian analysis um, when you've got, you know, something that we would normally think of, is you would just do an RCT. So like Bayesian inference for people who do impact evaluations. Um, so if that's the kind and like I would also refer you on to that Perfect. just because it has like a bunch of different um, scenarios and stuff. That's great. I had known of the um, Abadie paper on learning from null results, but but um, this this later one I'm going to look right up. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Garrett asks if you have a link to the McKinsey paper. No, I, I was emailing him yesterday and he was like, it's not out yet, maybe in the summer. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. Um, this is, you know, all based on, I think, um, methods that have been used more in other disciplines. Um, uh, a couple of nice resources there. I mean, the, the standard big book is, you know, like Gelman et al, um, Bayesian data analysis um, for how to, you know, make these Bayesian models. Um, that's, I think, yeah. the first one I would refer people to. Yeah, we call that the Old Testament in my household. Uh, <laughs> could you, Who's the New Testament? Minutes. Pardon me? <laughs> Who's the New Testament? Oh, um, McElroy's. What ah. are you thinking? Yeah. <laughs> um, could you talk, could you tell, talk a little bit more about the UBI um work and and maybe i mean are you planning to do this for that and... yeah no so we're definitely going to be uh forecasting the uh, results um and you know so i'm trying to think of what exactly i can say about that because some of it is you know obviously before oh, no, that, um, you know we've, we've got fine. results it's, it, it's just it's, it's a high profile study and so a lot of people are like yeah more to know so we're not going to be able to like talk about like results of things but we're gathering a lot of data it's actually mm. <laughs> my goodness so we've got um um you know first some in-person surveys we've got some mobile surveys well in person not during the pandemic but we've got some um yeah um in-person surveys mobile surveys we've got links to administrative data sources like tax records like um education data some limited health data um, this is a study that's done in the US, in two US states, I can't say which ones, um, and it's a thousand people in the treatment group, 2000 in the control, it's a really big study, if you calculate that out, that's like a million dollars a month is going into this study just for the incentives in the treatment group, and then we've got, of course, the survey incentives and um, we actually have a mobile phone app, which is also collecting um, some data passively. So uh, we've got some limited um, geocoded data. Um, we've got some um, time use data that we have like a time use app, um, Stroop task on the phone. Um, we've got, you know, nutrition diaries. We actually are connecting some bank data as well because, you know, you, you get the payment at a certain bank address and we ask people to connect as many accounts as they can. Um, and so we get some kind of uh, expenditures data that way too. So it's a huge, huge study and uh, it will be consuming for a long time to come, I think. 
Yeah, it should be a really major one. I remember if, it was announced a few years ago, right? With like Sam Altman and stuff, they were all mm -hmm. excited about it. And yeah, it's great to hear that you, it's, it's happening. It's going to be exciting when you can release the results. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Otherwise, I might just say thank you um, once again to Eva. That was just amazing. And um, go and sign up uh, for the, on the platform. <laughs> Thanks so much. I hope this is useful to people uh, like, you know, your own researchers in different fields, like, please do, you know, feel free to uh, and get in touch if you've got any questions. Yeah, that was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Take care.